So thanks. So today I thanks for coming, and today I'll talk about barriers for rank methods in arithmetic complexity, which is probably familiar to half of the room, uh, not including me. So this is joint work with Klim, uh, with Ankit and Avi. Uh, and okay, so let's start with some introduction and big background. I'll first talk about the big picture, and then I'll show you usually how lower bounds are proved in 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 arithmetic complexity. Okay. So I guess standing here is better for everyone. Okay, so the big picture now. Right, so algebraic complexity studies computations of algebraic objects, so polynomials, tensors, matrices, and it exhibits two main features. One is extremely interesting and extremely old, right? Even before computer science, Euclid already gave us the first algebraic algorithm. Then Gauss came with the fast Fourier transform. Abel proved the first already impossibility results, already have an unconditional barrier. And, um, and the structure theory of is a lower okay lower bound yeah okay lower bound that's okay that's okay sorry yeah so first order lower bound and then um, and the structure theory of of algebraic complexity is very similar to boolean complexity so for example the complete classes vp and vnp were developed by valiant shortly after the development of p and np well np um, the second point is that they're generally much easier to lower bound than uh, the Boolean setting. And why is that? Is one feature is algebraic computation is syntactic. It computes polynomials, whereas the Boolean computation is more semantic. You, you want to compute the Boolean function independent of its representation. It can have many representations. Um, and in the algebraic setting, we're more constrained. We have our hands tied behind our backs. Right? We can only use arithmetic operations. And a for, as a formal result, we know that separating p slash poly from n p slash poly is known under the generalized Riemann hypothesis to imply that v p is different from v n p. Okay. So, all right. So, since lower bounds are easier, well, what do we know? Yeah. Yeah. So usually G R H is is used to bound coefficient sizes is, 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 a, is a technical. Finite fields. Yeah, it's just more for. And it's used in other, it's, it's, a, it's always very powerful tool and uh, used in some other complexity without uncoding. Right. Okay. So, and okay, so if it's easier to lower, prove lower bounds in an algebraic setting, well, what do we know, right? So, in the bounded depth, uh, we have had remarkable advances, uh, especially over the last few years. For example, the work of uh, Gupta, Kayal, Kamath, and Saptarishi, um, and well, Shubangi and, and Medinal, and many other works, they prove a lower bound of n to the square root d for homogeneous depth for circuits of degree, oh yeah, so these are polynomials in n variables of degree d, okay, and these are the lower bounds that they obtain. So n to the square root d for homogeneous depth for circuits. And in 98, Grigory Evan Karpinski, and later Grigory Evan Rasborov, and Chilara and Mukopadiai, they prove ex, uh, a lower bound of n to the d for depth three circuits over small finite fields um, for, again, polynomials of n variables and degree d. And very recently this year, Landsberg and Ottaviani, they gave an n to the d over two lower bound over the complex, over the complex numbers for diagonal depth three circuits which is the warring rank, and I'll come back to this later, so you'll, you'll know what this lower bound is. And in 2009, um, Ron, and, uh, Ron and Amir, they proved the lower bound of n to the n to the 1 over delta for multilinear depth delta formulas, okay? These are the rough pictures, I mean, the exact statements I, I hid for. But that's roughly what they proved. Oh, okay. Now... Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, for all cases, yeah, they are tight, and also they are they are proof for for VP. Okay, so you show that polynomials that can be computed by by small size, but if you restrict the depth, they are really hard, right? This is including like Shubangi's result on this. So so for example, even here, there's a an, uh, a very recent result of Midinal and and 
and Ramprasad that actually proves this for, for a circuit that has linear size and depth 5. So there's a really like, strong separation between depth 5 and depth 4 already. Okay? But now, in the general setting, we have extremely, like, very little progress. So our best lower bounds for circuits is still bauer strassen from 1983, which is n times log n for, for circuits. And for formulas, we have a little bit better lower bounds, which is Kolokortia's lower bound, which is n squared over log squared log square n. And, uh, and in, in just this year, Brinal uh, proved the n squared lower bound for homogeneous algebraic branching programs. And in terms of computing tensors, for example, the lower bounds that we have are, are very bad. And the best lower bounds that we have, they're 2 times n to the d over 2 for d-dimensional tensors of side n. Okay, so if you, if you pick Cn and do d tensor power, that's the lower bound we have. And this is only a factor 2 away from the trivial lower bound. Okay, that's, that's surprisingly, we know surprisingly little about tensors. Now, when you see this, these remarkable differences, well, you wonder, right? So these bounds, for example, in particular, the bounds for one, even, they're, even though they're very strong, they're still very far from the bounds that you obtain for, just by counting for random polynomials. Okay? Well, the two, well, they're far by any measure, right? And it makes you wonder, well, why is that the case? Were the techniques employed in one, like, limited to the general setting? Or are they even limited to prove lower bounds for random polynomials? Right? And which makes us wonder, is there any barrier for, for the algebraic setting? Right? So, but before we talk the al algebraic barriers, let's just talk about the Boolean barriers. Okay? So lower bounds are harder to prove in the Boolean setting, so it should be easier to find excuses, right, for why we can't prove them. And this is indeed true, right? We have many results. So starting with relativization and algebraization, which is an extension of relativization, they prove that diagonalization methods cannot work. Um, and this is even like a bit stronger than that. Uh, but I won't go into much detail. But uh, an interesting result by Rasborov in 92 showed that any submodular progress measure cannot prove even superlinear formula lower bounds for non-monotone computation. So what is this is any progress measure such that the mu of f and g plus the mu of f or g, if it's less than or equal than mu of f plus mu of g, you cannot prove superlinear lower bounds on non-monotone computation. This is formula lower bounds. Right. And, and this is an unconditional result, an unconditional proof. It doesn't depend on anything. But then two years later, Rasborov and Rudich, they came up with the natural proofs, and they showed that no progress measure, any progress measure which is natural, let's say useful, construct, and large, they cannot separate P from NP under some assumption that you cannot construct PRGs efficiently. Okay? So this is a lower bound. That's, this is a barrier that's much strong, much stronger, but it's conditional. Okay? So we know all of these barriers. These are very famous barriers. But now, in the algebraic setting, since it's easier to prove lower bounds, it must be hard to find barriers. And that's indeed the case. We have looked for them, and we haven't actually found them. So for example, the works of Aronson and Drucker and Grosso, um, they try to attempt to encapsulate all of the lower bound techniques that we have done so far. They try to unify them into only one approach, okay, to try to come up with some sort of natural barrier proof. And what they did is, in the natural proofs, how do you represent a Boolean function? You represent it by its truth table, right? But, uh, but here, how do you represent the polynomials? Well, they just said, let's just represent the polynomials as a list of coefficients, as a vector of coefficients. And then what they showed is that lower bounds are essentially algebraic varieties, which are zero sets of polynomials, okay, in this coefficient space. And they call this separating module. So they said any lower bound is a variety in this vector space of coefficients. And they showed that almost all of the algebraic lower bound techniques, they can be seen in this way. So, um, yeah? Can, can you explain what does it mean to say that lower bounds are algebraic varieties? Like? Right. So what it means is that there, so essentially any, any lower bound is done by you find, a zero, if you find a polynomial, let's say, and you find the zero set of the polynomial. And you say all of the easy polynomials, they are contained, like if you look at, the, at them as a vector, right? 
this vector is contained in the zero set of this polynomial. It's contained in this variety. And then your hard polynomial is just something that you prove that is not in this variety. So the coefficient satisfies the coefficient exactly. The coefficient satisfies a system of polynomial equations and uh, Right. Yeah, so. Right, so the, in, the, in their paper, yeah, in these two works, they have, they just unified the techniques, but they prove no barrier there. They just said essentially these are varieties, and, you know, there's connections to GCT as well, but they prove, they, they establish no, no barrier, no. But this, this was, so. Forbes, Spilke, and Volk, and uh, Grosho, uh, Mrinal, Shubangi, and, and Mike Sachs, they, they attempt to put a, a, a complexity bound on, on these separating modules. So they try to fix that. And in the way that they did it is by essentially relating this to PIT. They show that if, uh, so that they essentially show that if these, these varieties can be described by simple polynomials, Okay, if they can be succinctly encoded, all of this variety of, of easy polynomials, then this, yeah, then this is equivalent to say that there's no barrier. So essentially, if you cannot succinctly encode these varieties, then you essentially have a barrier. Okay? However, uh, one, one thing that's still unsatisfied by their work is that they, they still don't have any strong complexity assumption to replace the pseudo-random one for the Boolean setting. Okay, so the only evidence that the that Forbes, Spilk, and Volk um, they presented to us is that they showed that essentially, um, essentially most PIT results. So essentially, this hitting set here, which I, I won't explain what it is, is essentially a statement about PIT. Okay, if you know what it is, um, yeah. If you don't know, don't need to worry. We're not going to talk about it anyways. But if you know what it is, it's essentially a statement about PIT. They said that if, if your PIT can be, if you can derive very simple PIT results, then uh, you have barriers. And the only, um, oh, sorry, you don't have a barrier. And the only explicit like, examples, they only show that there are examples of, uh, of hitting sets which can be made succinct. So they pick all the hitting sets that we know, and they show that most of them can be succinct. But I don't want to dwell much over it. I think the main point of these two works is that they still don't provide any strong or believable complexity assumption for, for the existence of barriers for these methods. Okay? Maybe I can uh, just summarize this. Uh, the essence of the Rasbo-Buddhist uh, you know, natural proof is that you cannot prove lower bounds in the Boolean setting because, uh, because you cannot distinguish the computation of the random function, which would be hard, from the computation of the pseudo-random function. It's, it's easy because we have construction, at least believable construction, but now we don't know for sure. Let's say something. We would like to say the exactly the same thing in the arithmetic setting. We can, you know, we cannot prove low bound because we cannot distinguish the computation of random polynomials from pseudo random polynomials. Only we have no idea what the pseudo random polynomial is. And we have no believable, even uh, complexity assumption. We'll say uh, under this, we can generate appropriate pseudo random polynomials. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, yeah, Aronson and Drucker they try to to come up with a, an idea of what is a pseudo random polynomial, but uh, yeah, but it's not successful. Okay. So now that we s we saw that okay, attempts of algebraic barriers are they're much harder. Let's talk about how do we prove uh, lower bounds in the arithmetic setting. Okay. So I'm going to show to you now general lower bound techniques, in particular the rank techniques which have been used. And I'll give you an example of a lower bound. OK? So what's the? And then you'll show barrier. And then, oh, yeah, and then I'll show barrier. Yeah, this is only section one. Yes, section two is coming. Yeah. So what is the general structure of a lower bound proof? So the general structure is you find the decomposition of your polynomial into a sum of very simple polynomials. And then you come up with some progress measure, OK, such that the measure is subadditive and mu of g is small on the simple polynomials that you, you decompose your polynomial. 
And then you find some explicit polynomial which has high measure. Okay? This is what can be encoded for the varieties, for example. Right? So, okay. So, okay, so let me just show you some examples of the compositions and then you can, uh, m many of them are natural to you guys. So, for example, in 79, Hi here, Phil, he showed that if F is computed by a homogeneous circuit of size S, then you can decompose F into a sum of polynomials which are, which are fact, which have really high factors, factors of really high degree. So you can factor GI as PY times QI such that the degrees, none of them have degree too high. Okay? And, well, you also have the tensor rank decomposition, right? I mean, if you have a tensor, you can decompose it as, as a sum of rank one tensors, right? And the tensor rank is S, is this minimum number. Uh, the warring rank, which I promised to explain to you guys, is if you have a homogeneous polynomial F in n variables and of degree D, the warring rank of this polynomial is the minimum S such that you can write F as a sum of powers of linear forms. Okay? And it turns out that 2 and 3, the, the warring rank is very much related to tensor rank. Is that like the symmetric tensor yeah. rank? What is it? Yeah. Exactly. It's the symmetric tensor rank. Exactly. Uh, and, and, well, we also have the decomposition of bound depth circuits, right? So if you have a circuit F computed by a depth H circuit of size S, usually we assume that the top gate is a plus gate, is an addition gate, and the decomposition that they use for the lower bounds is F is equal to sum of GIs, where each of these GIs is computed by a circuit of depth H minus 1 with a product, the gate on top. Okay, and usually those are simple. So D is the degree of the polynomial F. Yeah. Okay. So these are some examples of decompositions. And now let's talk about, in general, like the concept of proving a lower bound. So usually, um, so S is a set of simple polynomials. And then you have this S hat, which is just the span of S. So all the polynomials that can be computed as a sum of polynomials in S. And we, well, we can define the S complexity of a polynomial F as the minimum well, little s, I guess, such that the f can be written as a sum of polynomials in s. Okay? So you can see that this is a complexity measure. And in general, I mean, you don't need to have just this measure. You can have any measure that's subadditive, right? So you pick any measure mu from s hat to the positive reals, which is subadditive, and let mu of t for any set of polynomials t. Let mu of t be the maximum of the measure of any polynomial in t. So how do you prove a lower bound? Well, you can lower bound this S complexity of a polynomial F by the measure of F over the measure of the set S of simple polynomials. Right? Because simply the measure of F will be less than or equal than the sum of the measures here. Here. <laughs> Sorry, it was T, right? I should, I should, yeah. Mu of S I didn't define, I define mu of T. <laughs> Yeah, my bad. So, okay. So is that clear so far? Okay, good. So, okay. And now how do you prove a certain barrier, right? So let delta of S be the set of all subadditive measures um, over the set of simple polynomials S, right? For example, CS is, is, is a measure, is a subadditive measure, so it belongs to this set delta S. But usually, this measure is very hard to understand. Otherwise, I mean, we would already prove lower bounds, right? So usually what we try to do is we try to approximate the CS by a simpler measures in a certain subset of the subadditive measures. We look for particular measures. And a barrier for this, for this particular set of measures delta is just a bound on this complexity of the set of measures delta, which is the maximum. So notice that if I just look at this fraction here, mu of s hat over mu of s for any measure, this is the maximum lower bound that I can prove for the measure mu, right? Because any polynomial I chose to be in S, S hat. So then if I pick the maximum over all measures in the subset, I'm basically giving you an upper bound on how well this measure, the set of measures delta can do. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So therefore C, C of delta bounds the best lower bound attainable by, by a measure delta. And a barrier is what? It's proving an upper bound on the C of delta, right? Good. 
So now let's describe rank methods. Rank methods will be this delta that we're going to choose. Okay? So rank methods is essentially any measure which can be cast as the rank of a matrix. In the end, you're going to map your polynomial to a matrix, and this rank of the matrix will be your measure. Okay? How do we define it? In general, all the measures are like this. You pick a, a linear map L from your set S hat to some set of matrices over some field F. And then your measure is the rank of this matrix LF over the rank F, over the field F. And uh, yeah, so let's denote this set of rank measures by delta S of 0. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so little m is any number. You map, you map polynomials to any matrix. You can choose the size of the matrix that you want. Yeah, OK. I, I have an example. I have an example very soon. So. And get the rank of this matrix. Yeah, exactly. A subclass of all measures is basically pick any polynomial, map. Yeah, I'll give you one in two slides. Yeah, yeah, very, very simple one, and it's the one that basically essentially everyone uses in many disguises. Okay, so, so yeah, just bear with me for a second, and and, and I'll show it to you. So, for example, I just wanted to show. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so for example, any, but I'll show you explicitly how this can be, can be mapped as, as, as a rank. Okay, now, so essentially, all of these rank measures, they, they go by many names. So they go by the partial derivatives name, shifted partial derivatives, um, evaluation dimension, coefficient dimension, uh, flattenings, which is familiar to some of you. And I mean, they're essentially used in almost all of the lower bounds that everyone in this room at some point proved once, right? So, right, they're all special cases of rank measures. Okay, so let me show you now, Tony. Now this is the, yeah, it's exact, it's, it's here. Okay, so let's let me show you an example of a lower bound, and then understand concretely how these measures go. So let's prove a lower bound that Avi proved many years ago um, on homogeneous depth three circuits. Okay, so what are these circuits? They're basically sums of products of linear forms. Okay, and our polynomial will be of degree d, so the products go up to degree d. And the simple set of polynomials here is just products of linear forms. Okay? Now, what is our rank measure? Our rank measure is basically the matrix of partial derivatives. And how do we define this? We're going to map any polynomial f. Okay? So if you think of the rows of this matrix, is you're taking the derivative with respect to this monomial. So if, let's say if you have x a, as, as one of the rows, then you're taking the derivative of x with respect to, of f with respect to x. Okay, so here you take all the derivatives with respect to this monomial, and here you encode, in each row, you encode the, the, the derivative of f with respect to this monomial. The coefficients. the coefficients. Okay, so for example, let me go to the next slide. There's a simple example there. So for example, let's calculate L of x squared minus y squared, right? So we take the derivative with respect to x, and we get just 2x, right? So I have a 2 here and a 0 over there. And if I take the derivative with respect to y, I get 0 in x, and I get the minus 2 in y, OK? So this is a rank measure, right? So all partial derivatives can be encoded as a rank measure. And now what you want is the dimension of the space of partial derivatives is exactly the rank of this matrix. You good? Okay. Any anyone else? Oh, yeah, of course. So in this particular uh, rank measure, the linear mapping simply tells you write all monomials of uh, degree d over two on the rows, write all monomials of degree d, d over two. Uh, yeah, I think so. But I think Shubangi knows more about this because... Can we restate the results such that in every, every progress measure that's efficiently computable has a barrier? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I think we're gonna we're gonna state the barrier for even more, even stronger than that. Actually, we we don't require L to be efficiently computable. Oh, I see. So even okay. Okay. So here you have an example, and and how do they prove the lower bound? So essentially, they say the measure of f, which is the rank of this matrix of partial derivatives, is exactly the dimension of the span of all the partial derivatives when you take d over two partial derivatives, and then it's very easy to bound this quantity for the simple polynomials, right? If you have a product of of d elements of d linear forms, this measure is at most two to the d over two. You can think of it just basically by, look at the monomial, right? If you have a monomial of degree d, and you take all d over 2 partial derivatives, you get exactly d over 2, right? And any product of linear form is essentially a linear transformation on this matrix L, OK? So essentially, yeah? OK. And then you just need to find a hard polynomial. And they just find the elementary symmetric polynomial. And they show that the measure for the elementary symmetric polynomial is greater than or equal to n over d over 2. And you can see this by a leading monomial argument, right? You just take the derivative, look at the leading monomial, you map to different things. OK? Then you obtain the lower bound on the S complexity of the symmetric polynomial, and you get the exponential lower bound. Is that proof good for everyone? OK? OK, good. So now that we saw how the lower bound proof works, now let's give a barrier to it, right? So this is now where the results come from. Uh, so we have our results is we're going to prove barriers for tensor and warring rank. Um, and then we're just going to give you a proof for the warring rank if we have time. And then we're going to talk about some open questions. OK, so what is our first theorem? Um, so no rank, so rank methods cannot prove a lower bound better than n to the d over 2 on the tensor of any d-dimensional vector of side n. So remember that the best result that, that, for, that, that people could prove so far is 2 to the n to the d over 2. 2 times n to the d over 2. OK, I, I have it written down. So let me go down. So in particular, OK, this theorem shows that no rank method can prove super linear lower bounds for tensor rank, even when d is equal to 3. So if you have a three-dimensional tensor, you cannot prove super linear lower bounds using the rank methods. So the trivial bound that we have on tensor rank is n to the d over 2, which you can get just by flattening the tensor. And the bound that we get for random tensors is actually n to the d minus 1. So you see, we're a quadratic factor away from the bound for random tensors. And the bound needed actually for, to obtain circuit lower bounds through the work of Ramraz is actually n to the d times 1 minus little o of 1. So we're very far from getting even like lower bound for circuits if we try to use these rank methods. So it's impossible to get it. Right, so the, yeah, the best, yeah. If you use rank methods, so there's the work of Landsberg of Taviani that I've been saying for d equals to 3. And they actually also obtain 2 times, two times n as a lower bound. And you cannot get better than 8n. OK, so this is, is quite depressing in, for tensor rank. And for warring rank, the barrier is very similar as well. So what we show is that rank methods cannot prove a lower bound better than, again, omega d times n to the d over 2 on the varying rank of any invariant polynomial of degree d. 
So notice that we're not assuming any computational assumption on the polynomials. It's any polynomial. I think I'm confused about yeah. Sorry, can you yeah. Yeah. So for d equals two, the tensor rank is just on matrix. Just matrix. Yeah, yeah, it's three. I, the the Lenzberg Otaviani works for three. Yeah, yeah. The t <laughs> we have we have no barriers for d equals two. Yeah, that rest assured. Yeah. <laughs> n squared. N squared. So uh, three dimensional tensor. Yeah, yeah. So the rank of the tensor is n d minus one, right? That, that's a very good excuse for the rank methods, OK? But we also know some, some lower bounds that, I mean, they're still weak. They don't prove better than 2n, n, but they're, they're not rank methods. So there, there are chances that. So this rank method should, for example, rule out not just the usual representation. Like somehow I could take the polynomial, map it into some weird space, and take the rank of, uh, take the rank of that tensor or whatever. No, so, so you have to, let's say, you have to oh, map your tensor to a matrix. Yeah, yeah. So no, so our lower bound only for, works for linear mappings. So if you have a nonlinear map or more complicated maps and you take ranks, we still don't know. But, but I could increase the dimension, for example. I could, I could but uh, we don't care about the dimension, yeah. Any, any dimension of the matrix that you send, as long as your map is linear, you cannot prove better lower bounds. Yeah, that's why, like, Tony asked this in the, in the previous slide, and I said, no, you can choose whatever M. Yeah, it's any mapping. As long as your mapping, yeah. Exactly. Is the, is the map of the pick pick the polynomial f or your tensor, and you represent it as a list of coefficients. And this map is linear in the sense that sum of two polynomials or sum of two tensors map to the sum of the the matrices. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the, I just want to comment that it's not just complexity theories that they use rank methods of matrices, which they can understand. It's an extremely common method in algebraic geometry. They all do what they call flattenings. Right. Yeah. So the method of flattening. Yeah. Is it an assumption of field size? Huh? Oh yeah. So and the field size here has to be has to be large. Yeah. Thanks, Ankit. So the not much. not much large. Yeah. So they they have to be larger than the degree of your polynomial, essentially. Okay. So it doesn't matter on the the dimension of the matrix. Is if you have your field that's just bigger than the the polynomials you're trying to lower bound, that it's should be enough. Right. So, so, so basically, the result in terms of okay, so it's a barrier. But it, if I think of it as uh, okay, so can I state the result as just the following? Mm -hmm. Take any tensor, d d -th order tensor. Uh, generate arbitrary. So take any linear map of this tensor into uh, any matrix, mm -hmm. of whatever dimension. Of all tensors. Yeah, of all tensors. Choose a linear mapping. Exactly. Choose a linear mapping. To whatever matrix I like in whatever dimension. Yes. Then the claim is that there is a, a tensor uh, such that the linear map of the tensor would have, oh no, for every. For every tensor, exactly. The matrix doesn't have rank bigger than. Has rank at most, uh, at most this. Exactly. Yeah, that's. Times the rank of the rank one tensor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, times the. That's a barrier, yeah. OK, good. So then let me state the result for the warring rank, and then we're going to proceed to the proof of the warring rank, if you have no more questions. If you have more questions, I guess. There's three of us that can respond to them, I guess. So OK, so for the warring rank, again, the rank methods, they cannot prove lower bounds better than n to the d over 2 on the warring rank of any invariant polynomial, OK, of degree d. Now, this is important to notice that this almost matches the best lower bound achieved by rank methods, 
okay, which was achieved this year by Landsberg and Ottaviani, which is just a factor of d away, I think, d or d times n. So yeah, d times n, right? So I mean, maybe just d, maybe just d. So and notice that this this lower bound, okay, this this barrier that we show, it limits any of these rank techniques to achieve the best lower bounds for random polynomials, okay? So it's very far from random polynomials. So the lower bound that you get by counting for random polynomials is 1 over n times n plus d minus 1 over d, okay? And this is actually tight. Any random polynomial can be computed by rank of this size, okay? This is a big result, the upper bound. So, so again, here the field size is large. So yeah, again, the field size here is, is, is large, like, uh, so I, yeah, it's large. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's important to notice that here it's important that the field size is large because, for example, for depth three circuits, you have Grigoriev and Karpinski, they already prove an exponential lower bound for depth three circuits, which you mean like they actually achieve n to the d for, for the warring rank as well. So, they already prove really strong lower bounds, right? But because the field size is small there, the, the characteristic of the field is small, you can do these kinds of things. Yeah, it's not a rank. It's not a rank. They also, right, right, and they use and they use also some functional equivalence that is also not a rank method there, but but here we require the size of the field to be large enough. Yeah, yeah exactly. It would be possible even for a rank method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's prove now the warring rank case, and I'll I'll give up on the slides to be much slower. From now on, I don't know how much time I have. Eh? Oh, I have time. Okay, great. So plenty of time. So okay. So now let's do a recap of the general strategy, and then we can uh, proceed to the board. So, so what is the set of simple polynomials for us? It's just dth powers of linear forms, right? Which we can represent like this. And s hat is again the span of s, which you can see is all polynomials of degree d, and variables of degree d. Right? Because you can compute any monomial by a sum of these, these guys. So, and now let L be a set of linear map, any linear map from the set of polynomials of degree D to matrices of any dimension M. Okay? And mu of F again is the rank of, of L. Okay. So now if L is a linear map, okay, and F is any polynomial, so I can, I'm describing it by I'm indexing the coefficients by the, by the exponent of the monomial, then I can write this matrix LF by, I can just define any linear map. I can define the linear map in the monomials, right? I can just say, I can just say L of a monomial is equal to some matrix ME. It is degree D, yes. Yeah. So all, all of these E's there of degree D, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just going to talk about homogeneous polynomials, but you can think of it also works for non-homogeneous, it can homogenize, but homogeneous is simpler, yeah? So let's just see E, every time I say E is exponents of degree D, okay? So I can define this map L just by mapping any monomial X to the E to its matrix ME, and then any polynomial F, its matrix is going to be the sum of AE of its coefficient times the L of XE, right? Okay, thus, now the the size of the measure, the maximum measure over S hat, is actually the rank of this space of matrices ME, right? And the rank of a space of matrix is exactly the maximum rank that a linear combination of these matrices can achieve, right? So this is what we need to upper bound to obtain a barrier. Yeah? yeah? We need to upper bound this relative. Right, we need to upper bound this relative to, to mu of S, right? So we need to show that the ratio of mu of s hat and mu of s is actually small, okay? So for simplicity, we can think that mu of s is 1, okay? And then we just need to upper bound mu, mu hat of s. Okay, so now before we go to the board, let me just define what is L for, uh, for sums of powers of the inner form. So what is L for our simple polynomial, okay? So our simple polynomial, remember, is a sum of powers of linear forms and if you just write, if you just expand G into its monomial representation, what do you get? 
Well, you get some coefficient here times uh, a to the e times x to the e, right? So it's basically the monomials are encoded exactly the same way, and you have this coefficient as garbage. Um, so now notice that Lg, if I if I if I think of g, if I try to uh, represent g just by a vector of the ai's by an n-dimensional vector a1 up to an, my matrix L of g is essentially a polynomial in the variables a. Right? Is that clear for everyone? Okay, good. So Lg is a matrix whose enters their polynomials of degree d in these parameters a, which are going to be my new variables now. So each each vector a, okay, both faces is, is vector and everything else is, is scalar, okay? So any vector a will encode a, a power of linear form, right? And now let r be the measure on s, which means what? Is the maximum a vector that I can pick that will give me the maximum rank of this matrix Lg, okay? So in particular, this has a really nice characterization which this measure, the maximum overall possible values of A, is exactly the rank of this matrix, this polynomial matrix in A, over the field of fractions, FA, okay, with variables A. Okay, this is, a, this is just equivalence. Yeah, this is, this is, this is exactly where we use the field is large. Okay, and then maybe, can I go one more? Okay, so okay, so again, to prove a barrier, we just need to upper bound mu of s hat over mu s, which is exactly what? The rank of the space of matrices defined by the monomials over the rank over the fraction field of Lg, which here we define by R, right? So we need to upper bound the rank of the space of matrix Me over R, okay? And Exactly. We want to prove the rank of Me is a small multiple of R, right? I'm given the information that like these Me is the, if there's some subspace of them that have rank R, and we want to use that to bound the rank of everyone. So the plan to bound this rank of Me is to find some special decomposition of each of these matrices Me that will allow us to bound the rank of the whole space. Okay? And how, how are we going to execute our plan? Well, we're just going to f show that there exists a small subspace W, okay, it's of subspace W of small dimension, such that any of these matrices Me, they can be written of the following form. They can be written as W tensor some any, any vector, I don't care, but let's say pick a basis W in W, okay? So Me can be written as a sum of W times tensor any vector plus Z tensor any vector in W, okay? But the same one. But the same one, yeah. You pick, pick the same basis, and you want to show that, you know, you have outer product with one on the left and one, the same one on the right. And, and these can be arbitrary vectors, yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yeah. Some, yeah, you can pick two, but we can just club them together into one, yeah. Like the matrix is row space in W. Yeah. And the col exactly, that's exactly. Yeah, so then the rank of this space is bounded by two times the size of W, right? Because notice that any matrix can be written like this, but any linear combinations of them will also be written in the same way, right? Okay, so now, hmm, okay, maybe should I switch the board now to slow me down? Would you? Okay, uh, slow me down if, if I'm on slides then. Let's, let's try this and see if it works otherwise. Okay, so again, so for a, generic, for a generic linear form, we have this decomposition, right? So this matrix is a polynomial. It's a matrix of polynomials. Now, ah, okay. All right, so the idea is that, so to upper bound these MEs, what we're going to do is, can we find a succinct decomposition of this guy? Okay, now how do we find a succinct decomposition of this guy? What information are we given? We're given that this matrix here has really small rank over the fraction field, right? 
So what does it mean to have a small rank over the diffraction field? It means that you have a decomposition of size r with rational functions, right? So in particular, what can you show? You show that since the rank of L in the fraction field is R, it means that you have a decomposition as a sum of R rank 1 matrices, right? But these are rank 1 matrices over the fraction field, right? So you, you have to account. So you can think of these as matrices of polynomials. And this is actually just uh, the, the quotient, right? So you have this special decomposition, right? So UK and VK, they're vectors of polynomials. And PK is a polynomial such that, I mean, without loss of generality, you can assume that PK of 0 is 0. OK, so it's 1 minus something of high order terms. Yeah? Yeah, you get them just by shifting, yeah. You, you, you get just the regular decomposition. You shift and then take the homogeneous part, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. OK. Yeah, so in a sense, yeah, we want to, yeah, what Avi said. So the goal is basically instead of doing rational functions, we want to prove that you can just have a small decompositions where, where you have products of matrices that are polynomials. OK, so we're just going to convert this now from rational functions to polynomials. And how do you do it? Well, just look at the power series, right? So we can write this 1 minus pk of a as 1 plus some polynomial q1 plus polynomial q2 and so on, right? So each qi here is a homogeneous polynomial of degree like i, right? So here's the linear terms and so on and so forth. Now, the equality above here, this equality, right? Once I substitute this 1 minus pk by some power series, this equality now is an equality of power series of matrices, right? But here, I have a polynomial matrix of degree d. And here I have a power series, an infinite power series. OK? So what do we do? Well, we can just take the homogeneous parts of degree d on each side, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. And I get exactly just the degree d part of the other side, right? Which is this kind of ugly expression. Uh, so if we just, you know, sorry, if we just kind of, once you substitute by the power series here, just make this guy u hat. And then you have some power series. In the end, you just have the homogeneous part of uk hat times uh, vk. What is hd? hd is the homogeneous part of degree d. Uh, so you take the sum, this is a sum of power series, this is homogeneous part. Yeah, nothing fancy. OK? So again, now uk hat v and vk, they, you can think of them as vectors of polynomials. Right? OK. Now, uh, Note that, so this sum is the sum of homogeneous parts. Let's just look at the homogeneous part of degree d of one of these tensor products, OK? Of one of these tensor products above. Well, how can you decompose this? This is essentially, I can pick the homogeneous part of degree j here, and I'll have to multiply by the homogeneous part of degree d minus j, right? So I have a sum of d plus 1 homogeneous polynomials, right? So I do this decomposition for all the linear forms. For all, the, for all the tensors, yeah? And in the end, uh, what do I end up with? I end up with just with an extra sum here, j equals to 1 up to d. And now, I just have this a small sum of a tensor of, of rank 1 matrices of polynomials, as Avi said. So all these slides are essentially to transform something from rational functions to a small sum of matrices of polynomials, OK, of rank 1 matrices. Right. The cost of this was just to add this factor d plus 1. Right? OK. Now, since we have this decomposition, now how do we find the space w? Now, our claim here is that there's a very simple space w sitting down there, which you can use for row space and column space, as Gopi said. So what is the space? Just pick the space of low degree vectors of each of these polynomials. OK? So for example, in each of these products, let's say for each j that's small, this is a polynomial. This is a vector of polynomials, right? which you can write again as the, maybe I could use the board now. I can lift, right? So let me. No, no, this one is here. I have. We had 
training before. <laughs> okay, so let me. Yeah, maybe I should turn off the. Does this work if I just turn off? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, great. Ah. Okay, maybe. Can we just turn that off? Maybe. It's good because now I don't look at the light and. Oh yeah, this. Which then I need to do this. I need to look at my script. So. I think they should be fine, right? Okay. I mean, yeah. Oh, okay, good. It's better now. Okay, I'll leave the script on because I just need. To, okay, so we can see that. Um, so if I have this product, H of J, of U hat, of A, tensor H, D minus J. vk of a, right? Notice that, suppose that j is the small part here. It's small than d over 2. I can just write this as sum over uh, all the monomials e of degree. Uh, so these are all the monomials of degree j. I can write as a sum vector uh, uke times um, a to the e. Right? Now, how many monomials do I have of degree j? Well, I have n plus j minus 1 choose j minus 1 degrees, monomials, the vectors, right? So I have these monomials and I have these many vectors. So now, what do we do? Well, remember, we have a sum here of k equals to 1 up to r, some other sum of j equals to 0 up to d. But now for each of these sums, what is my space w? I pick all of these vectors of, of the low degree part, right? How many vectors am I picking? For each of these tensor products, I'm picking only the, I'm picking only n plus j minus 1, j minus 1, for each of these tensor products. And I'm summing over all j's, so j going from 0 up to d over 2. Right, because I'm always picking the, the low degree part. And I have k, I have, um, I have r of them. I have r sums. Right, so I have two of these because when j is equal to 0 up to d over 2, I'm going to pick all the vectors of the, of the, right, the left-hand side. And once j is bigger than d over 2, I'm going to pick these guys become the low degree. Right, so I pick all of the vectors of this side. How many vectors am I picking? At most, uh, two times the sum for, for each k. But I also have r of this case. Right? So I have this many. I'm giving an upper bound on the. No, no. So now, no, now I'm giving. No, now I'm giving an upper bound on the dimension, on the dimension of the space w that we need. Yes. Ah, okay, so let me, let me, okay, so again, just a recap, so right? So, so what do we need to do? So we, we want to bound the rank of this space, the rank of the space ME of the matrices of, of, all, of all the monomials, right? So what is our strategy? We're going to pick, we're going to show that all of these matrices here, they have a special decomposition. So we are going to show that these MEs, they can be written as, Let's say I'm going to say u in w1 and v in w2 in two spaces. I'm going to find two spaces such that any me can be written as u tensor, I don't know, z of u, and let's say z of v tensor v. Right? And then, so this is the space, the, the space w is the union of, of w1 and w2. Right? So if I show this, in particular, I show that the rank of this space is upper bound by twice the dimension of W. Yeah? Because 
Exactly. Yeah, it's because these yeah because these matrices they they are linear combinations of these powers. They can be written in this form. Oh really? Okay. Oh, okay, great. So, yeah. uh, we didn't talk about it, but uh, yeah. okay. Okay. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll see the video and. Okay, good. So. Okay, so is this clear how how we get this bound? So for every tensor product, pick the low degree part, and you're picking very little monomials, right? So you can upper bound this by n plus d choose d. Oh, sorry. Well, well, d plus one here, right? Oh, sorry. Yes. D over two. D over two. We're going all the way up to d over 2 only, right? So we can upper bound this sum by um, d plus 1 times n plus d over 2 over d over 2, OK? And therefore, we know that, so the space w now, this is the, di the upper bound on the dimension of the space w. Well, I have an r here as well, right? So r. Is there a factor 2 also? Oh, no, just d over 2 times over. Yeah, yeah, d over 2. Uh, you can go, yeah, you can go just sum to the D, and you're just going to get this anyways, no, no, right? No, no, I'm saying that you write the two because you say one is for the left and one, one is for the D, but they are the same space. They are the space of all polynomials. You don't know anything about them. They're right, the right. Of all polynomials. Oh, right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, just engineering safety. Just think of the two as engineering safety <laughs> number to, to make sure we're correct. Okay? Um, OK, great. So this is the upper bound on the space w, right? And now we, we get our barrier, right? Because what is the, what is the, the barrier of the measure is ex essentially, oh, this here. So if you remember, the barrier that we wanted to prove was the dimension of w over r. And this is exactly this quantity is equal to d plus 1 times n plus d over 2, choose d over 2. OK? So let me see what the, much better. Yes, OK, good. So uh, now I need the, oh, good, OK, this is good. I, I need this. Let's go back to the open question. I guess, is there any questions about this lower bound? OK, great. Yeah, this is essentially n to the d over 2. The yeah. floor is important. And the, flo the floor is important. <laughs> yeah, the, the floor is important because for 3, this becomes 1. And then not a half. Yeah. Yeah, so we're allowed to do engineering safety here, but not, not there. OK, so now, OK, is that good? Can I pull up the board again? Uh-huh. Hmm. OK, this is, see, this I didn't pass the training. OK. Yeah, OK, so oops. I guess it's a bit fuzzy, the open questions. We, we don't, we, we haven't figured them out quite yet, but uh, no, so, so the now I think, uh, so I, I, the proof for the tensor decomposition is, is, is very similar. OK, you just have a, a somewhat different decomposition, but uh, but it's essentially the same idea. And now the main open questions are, well, can we extend this barrier to other circuit classes? Uh, because we only have tensor rank and warring rank. Uh, and what about other mappings? Let's say, you know, what about nonlinear mappings L? Can, can, can they get better measures or, or any other mapping? And can we actually notice that the, the barriers that we prove, even though they're, they're just far from random polynomials, we still don't say anything, for example, like, general depth three circuits. Okay, we're not able to say much um, about depth three circuits. And those I mean, yeah. the low bound of the place of Right. 
So the lower bound that we showed in the lower bound, you know, goes via homogeneity, right? We use it in a very important way. But if you pick non-homogeneous circuits, and for example, non-homogeneous depth three, which is essentially the general lower bound, we're not able to say uh, much about it. Now we say a little bit in the paper, but we're not able to say much more than that. So can we actually show that these techniques are, they actually can be used to prove uh, better lower bounds? Well, we don't know. And I guess the last question is, uh, are these matrices decompositions tight? Because that, I think, is a more mathematical question. Mathematicians really want to know, you know, what bounds do you get? But uh, the, factor the factor d plus 1 is, we're d plus 1 away from, like, whatever bound we can exactly obtain by it. For degree three. So is it, it's almost the same. It's just that you have to do this. So, so OK, so let me pick a couple of words about the tensor rank. So essentially, you're still going to get the matrix of polynomials exactly the same way as the warring rank. But now the decomposition that you need to make, you need to respect the tensor structure. And then what you do is you do a multilinear decomposition. So instead of decomposing, like uh, you, you don't care about the monomials that are not multilinear, right? Because you can think of a tensor as a, as a set multilinear polynomial, right? So once you do the decomposition, you want to get exactly only those monomials. And then you pay a little bit more to get uh, matrices of polynomials which are multilinear of rank 1. It's not a little more. It's 2 to it's the, the D. Right, the, yeah. There you have, so there the bound that we get is 2 to the D times N to the D over 2. So, but it, it's still this 2 over D is nothing compared to the, yeah, especially for run's result, right? I think another parallel question is, okay, can you improve run's result, like run's reduction to show that any non-trivial tensor rank lower bound will actually give you lower bounds for circuits, right? So that we don't, we don't know if it's tight either. So on the other hand, maybe just rank bounds can still prove it. Even the, the barrier that we have here might not be enough even for tensor rank, right? Is there any example of a lower bound where a nonlinear mapping as, you know, somehow in the equivalent phrasing there is a nonlinear mapping L? There's a nonlinear mapping L, and they, and they take the rank. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that I, I don't think they, they thought about it. But there, there are instances of lower bounds that, that don't fall into this rank category. Ah. Uh, I can get I can get back to you probably after lunch. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of them uh, from. Um, so there, there's for example this this work of Alexev, Forbes, and Zimmerman uh, for tensor rank lower bounds. Uh, they they don't use uh, rank techniques. So their construction is some group theoretic con like lower bounds, and they don't, get bounds. they don't get better lower bounds than than they don't they don't beat rank methods. They get still two times n. Oop, sorry. They get three times n. They get three times n when the dimension of the when d is equal to three for the tensor, and for general tensors they get two to the n over d over two. But it's three times n. Yeah, it's for. Yeah, it's three times n on an explicit zero one tensor, like. But it's not a lower one on bottom. Well, it's not a lower one on bottom. It's, it's not. Bound yeah. Rank methods would always be the lower bound on border rank. rank. Yeah, sorry. That, that's a, yeah, there's a subtle, interesting discussion about border rank and rank. So this technique, for example, yeah. And I think there's like two or three more, which I can get back to you, like after lunch. But this is the one that comes to my head. Oh yeah, that's another one. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they use group theoretic methods to prove their lower bounds. So, yeah. So, can you say? Do you understand? I mean, I'm being unclear. What the what exactly the properties of rank play a role? I mean, is it clear what? I mean, it's not. It's not. Since 
you don't, for instance, the answer that the balance, you get known as all the fields that you're doing, the computations on there, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't seem to matter then how many may proceed as a particular rank, how the, the distribution of rank comes into the data. What matters? That's a good question. Right. All we use is subadditivity. Yeah. So you can replace this by any subadditive measure, and on uh, well, you need on, on the matrix, right? That, that you need the decomposition. Yeah. Any subadditive measure on the matrix will give you this decomposition. I guess you you can say yeah. Right. Now convert it to a huge determinant of a linear mass of the coefficient. Right. Any formula you can do it. If you did an exponentially large matrix that's linear, uh, if they have full rank on the high tensors and uh, you know rank n minus one on, on the, all the others. So so I, I don't think that formula is linear, right? You have to show that one what you, you evaluate it's, it's a polynomial. Uh, it's a polynomial mapping. Any But but you're saying but No, but then your measure is not subadditive, right? You just you just you just testing membership in a variety, right? That's exactly you're saying there's the variety. You, you encode the determinants further into a variety, and then you say, okay, now, but you don't have subadditivity. So then, then you're right. This, our approach is not bad.